Hi, I'm Brian Curry, tutoring high school biology. Today's topic, the origin of life. Earth is covered with life. You may have noticed. But it wasn't always like that. Earth used to not have any life at all. So the question is, where did all this life come from? Dr. Frankenstein hadn't been born way back on early Earth. So that theory's out. Well, Miller and Yeri were two scientists who tried to come up with their own theory. And what they did is simulate the conditions of early Earth. Here's a diagram of their setup. In it, we have our primordial soup. There's lots of primordial soup on early Earth. It had carbon dioxide, it had ammonia, it had methane, it had water. Humans can s not survive big quantities of too much aside from the water. Oh, actually, let me talk a bit about early Earth first. Early Earth. It was angry, it was shaking, it was exploding, it was always tearing up and coming back together and exploding, and it was heated and angry, and if you will, it was like a teenager going through puberty. Volcanoes erupting, lightning storms, Lots of good stuff. And that's all right here. We have a Bunsen burner heating the original primordial soup, if you will, and it would then evaporate and head into this chamber. Electrodes would shock it, simulating lightning storms. And then it would condense back into itself. And every so often, we'd collect a few samples. We discovered 20 amino acids, lipids and sugars. Now, 20 different amino acids, that's a lot. You use 20 different amino acids to make your proteins. These are the basic building blocks of life, and they have arisen from something that is not living. Okay, granted, these things aren't living yet. But it's a big step in the right direction. Organic molecules from inorganic molecules. Now, you may not be impressed. You may go, okay, not life yet. Well, scientists continued experimenting after these two, and they discovered something called a protobiont. These can arise given the right conditions. And you may have figured out a bit about these just by looking at the word. Proto, first. Bio, life. Protobionts. Now, there are several types of protobionts. I'm going to skip to one called the liposome. That's because it's made of a s inside, mostly water, and most importantly, a membrane made of lipids. You may remember, our cells are made mostly of a watery inside, cytoplasm, and a cell membrane made of lipids. Now, inside we have things like glucose, we have proteins, and it uses energy. It's a lot like a cell, but it's missing something. It can't replicate. It doesn't have the genetic information. Does it have DNA? We doubt highly that DNA was the first genetic material to be created. Why? It's just too complex. It wouldn't arise spontaneously. We think it was RNA. RNA, the single-stranded version of DNA. Slightly different, though. It has a lot of very intriguing properties. For instance, it can self-replicate spontaneously. Stick a strand of RNA in a jar filled with nucleotides, another strand will just come out. Complementary. And those strands can replicate again and again and again without using any energy at all. That means that this thing could keep repeating itself. This protobiont can make another protobiont and another one and another one. That's one of the big aspects of life, reproduction. But this could do more. RNA can even act as an enzyme. It can even help shape proteins. It could do the things that ribosomes could do. That is something. And it's starting to act like an organelle. Now, we don't know exactly how this happened, but jump forward a few thousand, maybe even a few million years, and you start ending up with real cells. The first ones, of course, were the prokaryotes, and then the eukaryotes. The prokaryotes, as we discussed, is usually a little more than some genetic material than ribosomes. But here we're going to go into something interesting called endosymbiotic theory. This goes about the discussion of certain organelles, the creation of mitochondria and chloroplasts. Yes, you will need to know this. Let's say we have a very little cell. It's a prokaryote and a very big cell. Not quite a eukaryote. But what if this cell glommed onto this one? What would happen is that this cell would end up with a second membrane for passing through the first cell's membrane and getting a dual coating, just like mitochondria and chloroplasts. And what if these cells were very good at making energy? or performing photosynthesis. That's where we think those particular, if you will, organelles came from. Prokaryotes. Indeed, if you look closely, mitochondria and chloroplasts do have their own DNA. Just keep that in mind. That's one step in the direction of eukaryotes that we know today. To recap, life arose from non-life, and young Earth was a very nasty place, very turbulent. Miller and Urey replicated young Earth with their experiment it had a lot of ammonium, it had a lot of carbon dioxide, it had methane, it had water. They evaporated the water, 
due to the heat provided by the Bunsen burner, shocked it with electrodes, and collected samples, revealing 20 different amino acids. 20 different amino acids are what we use, lipids and sugars. These were organic molecules being created from inorganic molecules. Scientists also discovered that protobionts, cell-like things, could arise given the right conditions. We also theorized that RNA was the first genetic material because it is easy to create, it spontaneously self-replicates, it can even act as enzymes in certain cases. Endosymbiotic theory states that mitochondria and chloroplasts, two organelles, were actually absorbed by larger cells and eventually became organelles, even though they were originally prokaryotic. So evidence for this includes the double layer of membrane, which mitochondria and chloroplasts have, and also they have their own DNA. All right, that's all for now. Again, I'm Brian Freer. See you next time.